righty, let's go ahead and get started. It is 6.05 and I would just like to say hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for day two of Goo Arts, brought to you by Operation Arts in partnership with SAS Factory and sponsored by the wonderful MSAC. All righty, um, so let's first tell you a little bit about uh, Goo, Global Entrepreneurship Week. Uh, the goal of Global Entrepreneurship Week is to make it easier for anyone, anywhere to start a business. It, it covers 200 countries, 20,000 partners, 40,000 activities, and over 10 million people. In 2019, our organization, Operation Arts, started Goo Arts to focus on artists and give artists the same opportunities to create a functional and thriving business. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my wonderful partner, Ms. China May, and she will give you a little bit of rundown about our organization, what we do. On to you, China. Hi, I am China, and um, our organization started in 2018, and our nonprofit officially started in 2020. And our mission for Operation Arts Foundation is to develop the creative economy. And our programming consists of public art, marketing support, um, resource sharing, opportunity cultivation, career training, and internships. And without further ado, I want to introduce you to our partner, Sass Ross. Hey, everybody. It's really nice to see you again. I'm seeing a lot of people here that I remember from yesterday. So welcome back. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience thus far. And before I introduce you to our ridiculously talented, oh so stunning, wonderfully impactful, amazing artist and educator, Michael uh, Mikey Bracco, I'm going to talk a little bit about Padlet. Uh, it won't take long. I am going to inform all of you that Padlet is our live Blackboard. We've been posting art there. We've been looking at all the links and resources that all the artists this week have been sharing. And I'm going to drop the link to the Padlet in the chat. And I want to remind everyone that I am your coach this week. If you have questions after the workshops, I have already met with several people post-workshop from yesterday about times that we can meet up to talk grants. So if you think you want to talk grants, you want to talk print packed application, some things that I mentioned yesterday regarding live events, I would love to speak with you. Aside from that, we do have some tremendous goodies and giveaways for your participation. So the more that you show up, the more that you participate, the more you will earn. Uh, so yes, please use the Blackboard for posting your work. I am carefully, closely watching to make sure that you know we are utilizing the resources and staying engaged because why have this if we're not taking advantage of all the resources? So if you wanna glance really quickly, I'm gonna do a quick walkthrough of the Padlet. And today is day two from process to product. And you can see already that Michael has amazing goodies in his column. If you give it a scroll down, he has links to his website and the amazing comic books that he's created and certain things that he has given you for homework to really make the most out of his workshop today. So give that a quick glance if you can. Yesterday, I reminded everyone, if you wanted to, if you want to post something, all you have to do is press this beautiful little plus sign at the bottom and you will see that a window will open up. That window will allow you to either upload a document, take a picture or add a link. You can choose either of those things to participate and post. You can add a subject line, a description line, and voila, there you go. You can post within the column. So I'm not going to take any more time away from our artist of the day, who is, he likes to be called Mikey, and I love it. It's Mikey Bracco. He is an art educator in Howard County, as well as an artist. He is a master screen printer, illustrator, and comic book artist. He has so much to share with you today, and we are getting 
some amazing footage and uh, information from his basement studio. So without further ado, Mikey Bracco, you have the stage. Welcome and thank you for being here. Hello. How, how I hope everybody's doing really well. Um, yeah, my name's Michael. Mikey is uh, what my friends call me. Um, <clears throat> I am right now. I wasn't sure when the right time to do it. Let me just make sure. Okay. Uh, hopefully you can all see my um, my screen share. Um, uh, first off, thank you to Operation Arts. Thank you, Saz, um, for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, this is really exciting. Um, uh, yeah, so um, this is from product to process. Let me just, just get my screen together. Oh, there we go. Pardon me for just a moment. There we go. From product to process, transferring your artwork into sellable, wearable products, manageable and accessible techniques. So um, I'm really excited to kind of talk about uh, my business, the things that I do, but really in an effort to um, uh, give any give anybody who wants to uh, the ability to come up with good design, uh, learn how to, uh, in uh, several different ways, put it onto products, uh, in this case, all wearable products, um, and just like build an actual product line of things uh, while doing it in a way that you can um, build up a studio within your own house. Um, so anyway, I'm going to jump right into it. I wanted to start off with a little bit of an icebreaker. Um, I am a, as you can see from the photo uh, from the opening screen, um, I am a screen printer. I have always just been in love with graphic t-shirts and the idea of printmaking. Um, I've always loved the idea of accessible art, um, things that are wearable and start conversations. And um, so um, I'm hoping that some of uh, that that's kind of a, a little bit of a universal thing. So for an icebreaker, try and answer the following three questions in the chat. Uh, with a single response if possible. So how many screen printed tees or apparel do you own? Um, zero, one to 150 is fine. I am of the latter of that. Uh, where have you acquired most of them? And describe your favorite screen printed article. Uh, for me, I put hundreds. Um, other than the ones I've made, I get them at craft shows and conventions. So I probably have more like thousands because of all the ones I'm printing. But of my own, I have like boxes of ones I've collected over the years um, that I don't fit anymore. Um, I have a huge box of medium t-shirts. I am no longer a medium. Um, and um, my my favorite tee is actually a Star Wars tee I got uh, at a show one time. I'm going to show it to you right now. Oh, why is this not doing the thing? There we go. It is an Argyle pattern that's made out of TIE Fighters. Um, I've always been a Star Wars nerd, but I never like pop culture t-shirts that are too obvious. And I love wearing this because it's just kind of classy. I've worn it like as, as far as t-shirts go. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear who here is into sc screen printed or graphic tees and what you have. Let's see. Also, if you'd like to just talk about it, feel free to raise your hand and um, just tell us about it too. That's totally fine. All righty, in the chat, it looks like uh, Kelsey owns two printed t uh, screen printed t-shirts and then the wonderful, looks like that was the wonderful Saz, has around 10, two artist markets, three bands. And uh, members of Queen are on it, which is pretty awesome. Oh, uh, wait. Do When you say three vans, do you mean you bought it in the van store or like out of the back of a van? I think she said band. 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 Oh, oh band t-shirt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, band. It, it, that might sound strange, but I, um, I have known many people who like just sell t-shirts out of the back of their vans on the, on the edges of street festivals mm -hmm. for as long as they can until they get kicked out. Great idea. Yeah. Uh, what is it? We have uh, Ijoma has uh, about around 10. Nice. Uh, and then uh, what are those graphic tees and three unsure if they're screen printed, but probably. And then we have Phoenix down here says about 15. Nice. And Emily 
has tried screen printing their own t-shirts with vinyl cut from a car cut machine. Oh man. Okay. Um, that's not an easy way to do it. The vinyl stuff is, uh, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that though. If you've made that successful, I'm in awe. I've never been able to do that one. Um, but hopefully what I have, uh, today is going to be something that's really helpful to that specifically. Um, I love, I love screen printed tees. It's, it's, um, it's, I don't know. I, I think that there's something about creating icons that um, I, I, I've made friends over t-shirts is what I'm trying to say. You know, like, oh my God, that's such a cool t-shirt. Oh, thanks. I got it. Blah. And, 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 and kind of like this, this icebreaker is something that I find that the t-shirt and, and different apparel um, is kind of a natural icebreaker in the real world. So anyway, I wanted to, um, let's see. Talk a little bit about myself and then dive into uh, the design element of this. So my name is Michael. I am an illustrator, an educator, an author, a performance artist, and a screen printer. Now, uh, uh, says I really appreciated that you called me a master screen printer, but I actually think that the point of this is I am not a master screen printer. It is more of a DIY, figure it out as I go along and try to make something that worked Within my house, um, our basement, which is, it's the holiday season, so it's kind of a crazy mess, is half screen printing studio and half pottery studio. My wife is a potter. Um, and um, it's it's crazy down here. And and most people have uh, a limited ability to build um, uh, a studio in their house or to afford studio space. So a lot of what this is is going to be how to kind of makeshift that in ways that are sustainable. Um, so, um, as an illustrator, I never really, uh, I went to, uh, Micah in, um, from 1997 to 2002 to get my, uh, which is Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, um, to get my undergrad in illustration and my grad degree in, uh, uh, in art teaching. And, um, I am a, um, I teach middle school art I have for 21 years. Um, I am 99% sure I saw somebody pop up in here who was my student, which is just really awesome and exciting to, to see their name pop up. Um, anyway, um, I never, when I left school, I never really wanted to do the whole like traditional illustration thing where I sent my portfolio into magazines and, um, uh, but um, as I've gone along, I've built relationships with local shows and uh, businesses and musicians um, and just have kind of built up a clientele who uh, like what I do and I'm really into the things that they do and these kind of really fun working relationships. Um, I do have links all over this. And one thing I wanna say throughout this whole thing is that um, in the Padlet that Saz was showing you is a link to this um, uh, the Google slideshow. I always want to say PowerPoint. I apologize. Uh, and this Google slideshow has um, uh, so many resources and everything we're talking about is linked to places you can buy things. Not from me. I mean, you, it does link to my shop, but I mean like supplies and instructions and video, you know, everything you could want. Um, um, so um, please feel free to um, make a copy for yourself and cut it apart and use it however you want. Um, but on my site, I have plenty of, um, examples of different illustrations I've done. My favorite thing in the world to do, uh, I've always wanted to, uh, make books. Um, and I've, I've been making comics since I was a little kid, uh, professionally since about 2007. Um, I have, uh, illustrated some young adult books and, um, written and drawn and co-written and drawn, um, uh, a plethora of graphic novels. Um, I love science fiction and kind of most of my works is in that science fiction and fantasy realm. I also, as I said before, I'm a performance artist. I work with a group called Super Art Fight, um, which is a uh, improv comedy show. It is a parody of professional wrestling, but instead of uh, fighting with each other, um, if you see in the upper left, that that is me um, in front of a giant uh, 10 foot wide canvas. Uh, instead of fighting with each other, we draw at each other competitively to themes. And the whole thing is announced like professional wrestling by comedians. Um, we all have kind of wrestling per personas. I myself play a really bad Eastern European male model named Baron von Sexyful. Um, you can see uh, down on the bottom right, there's uh, uh, Titanium, who is our resident um, 
uh, metal queen. Um, we have referee. It's it's a really fun thing, and it's 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 all about like quick thinking, artistic thinking, uh, in order to get a laugh. And of course, uh, screen printing. Um, I actually uh, learned screen printing my senior year of college. I just happened to uh, realize I needed a screen printing credit or excuse me, a printmaking credit in order to fulfill something for my art ed, uh, my art education degree. And I was like, oh, screen printing sounds cool. I see a lot of people doing stuff with that. And I fell in love immediately and um, uh, had the, the, the greatest facility in the world at MICA, just everything I could ever want, plus like private drawers and places I could store things. And then I graduated and I had to figure out how to build a studio without tens of thousands of dollars um, and make something that was sustainable and, and workable. Um, and 90% uh, of everything I do is just, um, a, a, it starts with a drawing and in a sketchbook. Um, so since uh, 2007, I have run my business, uh, Spaghetti Kiss. Spaghetti Kiss is, um, oh, I forgot to put a picture of the, um, what's it called? Um, my little logo on here. Um, but it came from a painting I did in college of two monsters with multiple tongues uh, making out. And I called that a spaghetti kiss. And uh, actually, let me see, I think I have, you're probably right now looking at my um, uh, PowerPoint, but I'm gonna try to put this up. I don't know if anybody can see that. We can see your wonderful spaghetti kiss logo. It's great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, pardon me while I pull, put it back. Uh, I just thought it was like a funny thing uh, to name a company after and have people walk up and be like, oh, spaghetti kiss, like lady in the truck. Oh, my God, that's gross. And and then think about who would enjoy the work. Um, ever since then, I have uh, I, I. I do sell on uh, like I, I put products online and have like an online marketplace. Uh, however, that was never my main source of how to get my work out there. I've spent a long time um, uh, building up relationships with craft shows, street festivals, comic conventions. And my booth is kind of made up of my screen printed tees and my books and any other products that I'm putting together at the time. Um, I've done, uh, um, I, I think uh, right here kind of spans the gamut a little bit of two kind of larger shows. If I remember correctly, the show on the right is, I'm trying to get a good read on that. I'm pretty sure that's Arbutus Arts Festival. Um, and so like a, a larger street festival. And then on the left was my booth at New York Comic Con with my writing partners. All right. But, you know, enough about me. I wanted to give you a taste of the things I do. Um, uh, and I wanted to introduce you to the best Bitmoji of all time. I feel like Bitmojis never look like people, but mine looks frankly like me, even though I don't have the pink mohawk right now. Um, all right. So the workshop goals for today, I wanted to present some techniques for making good design for products and give a drawing prompt. Um, that's right. I am going to ask you all to draw. Um, go over the elements of a home studio at different levels of accessibility and demonstrate screen printing. Uh, those two are kind of going to go back and forth a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about alternatives to building a home studio and just go over as many different ways to get your item, your designs on different uh, on, on T-shirts um, as possible. Uh, and I'd really love to, uh, a time to like actually share drawings and uh, uh, give you uh, time to draw, give you time to ask me questions, um, and um, uh, just kind of like sit with each other, maybe give feedback on drawings. Um, I also made a Padlet just specifically for this. I made a Padlet that you can access through the Padlet that Saz was showing you. Uh, I hope that's okay. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll jump into that later on to show you some things that I've done. Um, but let's let's just get into some some uh, designs uh, so to our drawing prompt. So I want to do something based around hybrid design, which I think on a base level is kind of the best way um, to start thinking about designing a T-shirt. Uh, a good T-shirt design is iconic and immediately recognizable. It also needs to be thought provoking and well crafted, giving thought to how the drawing, um, oops, the drawing will translate to the screen print stencil. Oftentimes, this is achieved through hybrid designs where the designer combines two subjects into a new idea. The reason this works as a product is that if someone latches onto both subjects, they identify with the design and really personalize it. 
and feel as if it speaks to them. Um, the first one that really spoke to me when I was doing my research. Uh, oh, and every one of these, uh, I'm I'm pretty sure uh, all the artists, instead of linking them, I just put it in here. I found them all, uh, a lot of my examples on Threadless. Uh, uh, and a lot of these artists are people that you can like, like just, if you take a half an hour and just do a deep dive on Threadless, you can see some of the most brilliant ideas you'll ever see for t-shirts. Um, so this artist, Radio Mode, just um, beautifully like does this image that is very simple. It's single colored, but it's immediately recognizable as both a, um, um, I, I never remember what to call these because my daughter calls them wishes. Um, yeah. Um, and um, they're not dandelions, are they? What is the actual term? Dandelions. It is, it, it is, it's just like a. a it's the yeah. seed of a dandelion. Thank you. It's the dandelion seed. Thank you. So, um, and, um, and, and of course the bottom is the basket for a hot air balloon. And you can just picture, I can just picture my daughter blowing on this and this little guy being like, yep. And away we go. And I think that there is this, this idea of in good design, where as soon as you get it, you're either like, oh, I get it. That's neat. And you walk away or, oh, I get it. That really speaks to me. And I, I want to wear that. I want this thing to start a conversation. Um, sometimes it's with two things that are just visually connected. Uh, and um, other times, uh, here are two of mine. Um, the one on the left was me, uh, my first attempt ever at, at doing a Baltimore themed uh, t-shirt. Um, Baltimore is, uh, uh, if you're not from around here, it's all about crabs and crab cakes. Um, and um, there's also a big like kind of rockabilly culture in Baltimore. And so of course the skull is, is, is such a huge um, icon. I mean, everywhere, but in Baltimore, like mixing it with the crab was like a really good way for me to kind of tap into those two um, aspects of Baltimore culture on the right. Um, uh, I love to draw tentacles and um, um, it's kind of one of the things that I've become, I don't want to say known for, but I very much, I, I, people identify me with my work is the amount that I draw uh, tentacles but I'm constantly listening to people talk about their their pets, especially their dogs, and nobody talks more about their dogs uh, than they do about their pugs. And so I I, I love the idea of drawing this pugapus with the big sloppy tongue and the eyeballs kind of coming out as stocks. Um, and um, my favorite part of this design, if you look closely, instead of suction cups, they're all little, and I'm sorry ahead of time, it's a little gross, but they're all little doggy nipples. Um, and uh, in both of these cases, it's very much a, you know, a design that if I'm at a tent and I'm outside, I'm, I'm trying to, to kind of sell and um, bring people into my tent. And so the images are designed to be recognizable and interesting from 20 paces. And which I think, you know, and, and so you immediately look at it and go, what the hell is that? Oh, okay. I see how that all fits together. And I either identify or I don't. Um, Here's a couple others that I found that I just thought were really, really fun. Um, uh, the, the one on the left, uh, these are both uh, pop culture, obviously, designs, um, which is very popular. It can get very tricky with pop culture designs. I don't often do it. Um, I, I almost never like use other people's um, um, characters in my designs, just for the sheer fact of I like coming up with characters, but I know a lot of people who do. Uh, I'm not the best resource for knowing like the laws about how you do that. Um, however, these are two that I I, I kind of liked for different reasons. I really love the design of this Pac-Man Death Star. Um, I, I I think it has an awesome silhouette, which is something I want to talk about later. I think it um, <clears throat> it's so. Um, I'm curious. Uh, actually, in the chat, I'm curious how many of you saw Pac-Man first. And then notice the Death Star. And then how many of you saw, or and maybe didn't even see that until I said it. And how many of you saw the Death Star first and then Pac-Man? So either put Pac-Man or Death Star in the chat for whichever one you saw first. All righty, so going through the chat, we have uh, Pac-Man, Operation Arts, me, I saw the Death Star. Kelsey saw the Death Star, didn't see the Pac-Man. Sophia, I just thought it was the Death Star. Emily, Death Star. 
Ijoma, Death Star, Saz, Death Star, Phoenix, Death Star. A lot of Death Stars. Yeah. I'm, that's uh, simultaneous. That's awesome. I absolutely saw Pac-Man first. And I, I was assuming people would because of the factors of, one, the shape, but two, the color. The color. Um, but I, I think it's really cool that um, so many of you saw the Death Star first. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Um, uh, one, one of the things that's cool here is uh, it sounded like at least one of you didn't see the other thing until it was brought up. And if you can think about, and, and, and this is kind of for everybody, but think about that moment when you saw that second image, that second thing, and how you have that like little chemical in your brain that just kind of like clicks in and it's like, oh, I get it. And then it's either something you care about or not. But, you know, there is that moment of recognition, that moment of just like, I got it. Um, one of my favorite things about this, though, actually has nothing to do with the design. It has to do with the textures in the background. That star pattern um, gives a little bit of, um, I'm going to call it a gray space, even though it's yellow, um, and, and, and does it very successfully. Again, it's a single color image. Most of the images I'm going to show you are single color because it's how I work and it's how I can kind of talk about how to build up a studio. On the right, um, this one's a little bit more obvious because it's actually taking two characters uh, uh, but putting it into a famous painting, which of course is Edvard Munch's The Scream, uh, and it's Cookie Monster and the Gingerbread Man, I, I assume from Shrek, but I guess I don't really know. Um, I, uh, but every time I see a gingerbread now, all I can think of is Shrek and not my gumdrop buttons, you know. Um, and uh, uh, the saddest part is Cookie Monster doesn't actually eat any of his cookies. He just crunches them up, nom, 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 and lets them fall to the floor. So his death will totally be in vain. It's very sad. Uh, <laughs> All right. Okay. Here's a couple more. Um, the one on the left has both a, I don't want to uh, say a pop culture reference, but a cultural reference, uh, which is um, Hokusai's um, tsunami from the, uh, oh, I forget the name of that painting, but it's got uh, Fuji in the background um, and uh, in a coffee cup and just taking something. So such an epic classic painting and mixing it with um, every like so many people's like absolute need based fuel, um, and and then um, another uh, you know uh, anything coffee or tea or beer or the things that people like consume and obsess over pizza, um, ice cream you know things like that are, are are just such good starting places for ideas, but also so are things like animals and hobbies. If you don't play the banjo or don't have an affinity for buffalo. There is no reason to care about this shirt on the right. Um, however, um, I, I saw this and immediately thought of the customer that I would be servicing with one of my drawings that uh, I don't print, but I'll post online and get, a, oh my God, if you printed that, I'd buy a hundred of, like everybody would buy it. And I realized it's just that singular person's kind of niche um, interest However, a lot of design is coming up with niche interests and figuring out crossovers and things like that. And then Digital Carbine is a fantastic um, um, designer. Um, I'm not much of a sports guy, uh, which means I'm going to talk about the one on the right first. But um, I love space. And man, I can't I can't tell you how many uh, like kids I know who are on soccer teams who are obsessed with astronomy. And just the idea of thinking about that and, and parents who are with those kids or, you know, um, parents of those kids who just want to kind of be in the world of a kid's interests. And then I am such a huge like sci-fi fantasy person, this moon as a sail. Uh, it makes me think of, uh, uh, it makes me associate it with things that maybe weren't intentional. I really think this is just meant to be a boat attached to the moon. But I immediately think of one of uh, my favorite movies, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. I don't know if any of you have seen it, um, but there is a whole like, you know, airship that is, um, I put Y in the chat if you've ever seen The Adventures of Baron I've Munchausen. I've definitely seen it. And it's wonderful. It wonderful. definitely strikes that chord with me. Right, yeah. And so I would buy this and be like, oh my God, it's a Baron Munchausen t-shirt. No, it's not actually, but uh, you know, it, that's that's the thing that it would like build up in me. And I can't tell you uh, how many people will look at drawings of mine. And uh, and I think I have one of them here. Uh, I draw a lot of robots. 
and people will see my robots and every time we're like, look, it's the Iron Giant. It doesn't look anything like the Iron Giant, but there's something about the design that just reminded them of, of something that they love and they have an immediate affinity towards it. And, 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 you know, it's not me trying to cash in on that as much as it's me drawing something that's authentic to me and realizing that other people kind of find different ways to connect with art. Okay. This is telling me to turn on the heat setter. This is a, a, a slide that is just for me so that I can demo. Uh, so I'm gonna do that now so it starts warming up. All right, so I have a heat setter. There's a picture of it right there. Um, it's essentially, uh, the, the, there's a, you can see right here, there's a wooden, um, I don't know, can you see my cursor when I move it around on here? Okay. Oh, that's great. Thank you. So there's a wooden uh, like table on an arm that swings around. Uh, and I'll show you this in, in more detail. And, and right above it is this thing which generates heat and kind of forces it down. Um, so when I print a t-shirt and it's all wet on the t-shirt, I swing it around. It sits under there for like a minute or two. And when it comes back around, other than needing to cool off, it's a finished t-shirt that you can wear and throw in the wash forever and it lasts forever. All right. But I digress because I have a terrible memory and, and I'm a rambler and I get carried away. So I wanna give you all a drawing prompt. So I want, uh, and before I, I, I talk about it, um, I am somebody that has my whole life dealt with uh, really bad focus and attention issues. And um, I was one of those kids that um, my parents were really nervous about my grades because they weren't the best. Um, and uh, the only thing that they could come up with was that I drew in all my classes nonstop and it looked like I wasn't paying attention. So they forbade me from drawing in class and my grades went from like B's and C's down to failing. And because my mind would just wander and I would daydream and not be able to focus on anything. So they were like, oh, no, 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 no. You go back to drawing. We recognize you need it. And we're just going to have to live with our B student. And um, so uh, I tend to draw while I listen to things in order to focus. So I invite those of you who are that way or who uh, love to doodle to draw while we are, while I'm talking. And um, um, when, you know, uh, because you do have access to this. Um, and I, I am gonna ask you to, to share out any little doodles or sketches, um, but the drawing prompt is this. Uh, combine two of the icons in the list below into a hybrid icon. Consider some of the techniques on the following slides to make your design suitable for printing. Now, most of the techniques I'm going to talk to you about are, are more like long-term drawing techniques uh, in that like you're going to spend like an hour to five to 10 hours on a drawing. But a couple of them are things that you can really use in the moment while you're drawing. So I've put them in different categories here. Uh, in blue, I have octopus, owl, fox, cat, spider, different animals. Uh, also animals that are very popular in the design world right now. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, most of these are actually pretty tried and true icons uh, when it comes to t-shirt design. Uh, for food, I have taco, ice cream, pizza, and then coffee slash tea. Uh, in orange, I have robot, mermaid, and dragon for some uh, fantasy type um, or, or, or mythical uh, uh, things. And then uh, for more like... Um, hobby-based items. I have a guitar, a sewing machine, a tennis racket, and a camera. Now you can work directly from this list. You're probably going to want to combine things that are from different color categories. Um, but if you're like, oh, I have an idea and it's nothing on this list, or this, you know, brought me to something else, go for it. That's totally fine. Um, but here's some things to think about when you're drawing. Things to consider, there's three major things when it comes to screen printing and just good design. You wanna think about line weight, thicker lines will show up more, but using varying lines could be a great way to create depth and texture. And, uh, but as long as the lines that tell what's going on are nice and thick, it's gonna translate really well on a print. Silhouette and placement. The silhouette of an image in the, is the composition of how it fills the garment space. And the placement doesn't always have to be dead center. There's nothing wrong with the dead center design, but sometimes you can kind of push away from that. And then finally up here is texture and gray space. Um, screen printing limits you to printing solid layers, like solid colors. And I print only one color images. So you can't really print shades of gray in the traditional sense. However, you can use zip tones, cross hatching, um, whatever you can do with ink, you can do with screen printing. 
Um, and uh, sometimes smaller things don't come through all the way, but that's kind of the nature of printmaking. And those little imperfections are what give it personality and make it feel like a print as opposed to a pen and ink drawing. So to give you some specific examples of these, for line weight, I, 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 I chose a couple. Uh, one is my design, and it's my exception to the not uh, drawing other people's uh, characters, and I'll explain it in a second. Uh, but I'll talk about the other one first. Uh, I just love that this has just this variety of lines, and there's big, thick, inky lines for the ink that's turning into octopus tentacles. You have very delicate lines drawing out the, the sails with big, empty spaces to really give that smooth finish. And then you've got tons of little directional lines in the um, uh, boat itself, the wood of, uh, and the grain of the boat, um, along with some thick lines around the masts and the cross masts. I know that's probably not what they're called, but cross mast is the best I'm going to do. And um, when it comes to screen printing, a drawing like this would work pretty well uh, as long as you're, you're, you're printing pretty big. And some of these smaller lines might not show up perfectly but that crackling of those lines is only going to add to that depth and texture. Okay, so for mine, uh, one of the things with a single color print, it, and, and this is not a, uh, like, just the image. This is actually, like, just an iPhone pic of the print on a T-shirt. So you can, you know, so it's not a perfect image, which is on purpose. So you can see how clear things are, even when it's not super um uh, like, uh, you know, just like a digital photo with things doctored to make things stand out. This is on a body and, or at least on a rounded mannequin. Uh, and, and, and with all its imperfections in that, we can still see it. So I don't dr normally draw other people's characters. This is what I tell people when I'm at a show. But back in January, Winnie the Pooh went into the public domain. And I wanted to, um, you know, have a little fun at Disney's expense. And so I decided to mash up Winnie the Pooh with Mad Max. And um, just because Disney has all this involvement, a lot of big companies have a lot of involvement with, um, um, what's it called? Uh, copyright stuff and how they've like maintained copyrights on things. And it's like when something that Disney owns comes into public domain, why not mess with that? So um, if you're familiar with Mad Max at all, um, Christopher Robin is Max. Pooh and Piglet are Master Blaster. If you look down, hanging from Pooh's neck, they lost Rabbit along the way and wear his foot in memoriam. As they travel across the 100-acre wasteland to find Eeyore, and if you see, Eeyore's tail is uh, on uh, the chest strap of Christopher Robin so they can return his tail to him. And a, a big part of uh, making a shirt clear, and this isn't one that's supposed to grab somebody at 20 paces, this is very much a design that's meant to, once I get somebody in the tent and they're kind of looking through, they kind of stop here and are like, oh my God, is that Winnie the Pooh? And then it gives me that chance to start that conversation and tell them about the origins of the design. But it still has to be clear. So I have to very much think about the lines that sep and the lines that separate Pooh and Piglet, whether it's the, um, the cauldron filled with honey that Piglet is coming out of, giving some black space to separate their faces, or the lines around Christopher Robin and the hatch marks on Pooh that kind of create a shadow that creates some contrast. The, the black of his boots and his shoulder um, um, armor. I was going to say shoulder pad, but it's much more like bony armor. To the big shadowy forms of the honey that is just dripping off of his hands. And these lines are what I think pull this design together. Um, I think without it, it just becomes this big gray mess. But this is one that um, has been a really popular one for me. One, be because pe people can see the um, the story as I tell it very simply, very plainly, and then are excited to tell other people about that design. All right, another one is silhouette and placement. Silhouette is, um, I would say, arguably the most important part, and it's the one that you can think of in the very beginning stages. So when, if you're sketching today, if you've already started something, fantastic. Just look at it and think about what it's going to look like on the shirt. Um, if you're on uh, threadless and just piling through shirts, just going through them all, you're going to see a lot of cool things like this. And sometimes it's about using the negative space of a shirt 
um, uh, like this one on the right by Emery G. Just search Emery G on Threadless to see some of their other work. But the black of the shirt is uh, coming in and, and turning into the shadows of circling sharks around this bright blue space and uh, a lone swimmer. Uh, the, it, it makes the entirety of a black shirt become an unlimited army of death around it. It's just such a brilliant, simple, it's essentially just a circle, but it's a circle used so beautifully uh, to really create a good design. So thinking about how that works uh, can be uh, really, really um, great. Uh, and other times though, like using the, the the black of a shirt doesn't have to be so much part of the concept. One of the things I really loved about that first design I showed you, the 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 uh, the uh, uh, wish uh, dandelion hot air balloon, is how the you know if you have the center of the shirt, if I draw a line down the center of the sh shirt, you can see this like tilted off center like subject. And then all of the remnants of, or, and the little seeds are blowing it off off center. So it creates uh, actual movement. Um, when I'm teaching, I'm always talking about how to create um, uh, potential kinetic energy in illustration. The idea of how um, if you take something and you draw it, like if you draw a, 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 a little ball, a circle, and you put it on a flat line, it's going to feel like a circle on a flat line. But as soon as you tilt the line under it, our brains know that gravity would pull that ball down. And because of that, we actually perceive a feeling of movement when we look at a circle drawn on a slanted line. And it's the same thing here. We perceive the movement. We, we think of where this item is going and where it's been just because of that slight tilt, that slight off-centeredness. And it's all because of that perfect silhouette and placement. And uh, the last thing uh, to think about when you're doing this is that idea of texture and gray space. Um, the only reason Pac-Man looks like the Death Star and not just Pac-Man is all of those beautifully drawn and contoured lines of the Death Star. Also, the fact that it has the atmosphere made by that gray space, those speckled dots behind it, really gives it some nice atmosphere. If we look over on the right, I found this one by artist uh, Nice Bleed, um, again, through Threadless. Uh, if you're seeing any of these and you're like, oh my God, I love these, you can actually go on there and buy them. A lot of them are on sale uh, and I don't get any kickbacks. It's just, I actually bought one today, uh, a shirt. I should have put it up here. I'll see if I can find it a little later to show you if we have time. Um, now, the great thing here is this looks like a charcoal drawing or a graphite drawing. And it really is just somebody taking um, if you're familiar with Photoshop, taking a, you can actually take charcoal drawings and you can, <clears throat> you know, when you change it from like CMYK, R, RGB, grayscale, and then bitmap. If you change them to a bitmap, there's all these little things that you can control to turn it into zip tones or just lines. And as long as it's large enough, you can actually turn that into a screen and print it and it'll turn out great. Okay. So home studio, if you've never screen printed before, it's actually not that difficult of a process, but setting up a home studio can be really overwhelming. I've slowly built up my studio over several years, but when I started, it was, it was actually extremely simple. Uh, mostly um, the, the big thing when, when, when screen printing in your basement is recognizing that part of your costs are uh, the amount of time you're going to spend screwing up. Um, figuring out how long uh, you need to like set the distances in the specifics of your studio um, uh, can can take a little bit of time and a lot of trial and error. Um, so um, there's three main sections of home studio. Uh, there's an exposure station, which is, uh, let me see if I have, yeah, uh, to get your high detail stencils burned into your screen. Um, there's a printing station where you print and heat set your product. And then there's the washout station where you clean all your equipment after a session. All three of these are extremely important. Um, if you're going to do a photo emulsion style where, um, which I'll go over in a little bit. So I wanted to give you a first, a studio tour and, uh, do a screen printing demo. So I'm actually going to stop sharing and I'm just going to highlight my camera. This may get a little bit awkward, uh, as it's going to be me like carrying my laptop around and be like, this is where I do this and this is where I do this. And like I said, it might feel a little overwhelming, 
but I've got all the resources for how to build, put together, and 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 where to find everything. Um, and hopefully by the end of this, it you're going to be able to figure out what works for you. Uh, for, and I have it set up where it goes from like obscenely simple up to pretty complex uh, as far as what I do. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing. And um, I don't, let's see, can I pin myself? Does that pin me? Am I nice and large and in charge? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. And and I'm sorry. Uh, this is making me very aware of how gray I've gone since COVID. Um, all right. Okay. So like I said, there's three major things. Uh, the lighting in my studio is usually very harsh. Um, you can see right above me, I have this fluorescent lighting, um, but it makes everything look terrible and you can't see anything. Uh, so right now I have a lot of spotlights. All right. So uh, as you can see, I work in my basement. Um, if if on my Instagram account, um, I, I do a lot of reels that are just like me printing. And I always refer to my studio as the Spaghetti Kiss Dungeon. Uh, and it really, it really does feel like, like at least three Saw movies were filmed down here. And I apologize for that. Um, so, um, I do have an exposure station over here and it's literally just a light table. Um, I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to face this away first. Let's see if that, yeah, you can see it's, it's got UV lighting in it. Um, this is, uh, something I've acquired over the years. Um, these things can get a little bit pricey, however, um, can be DIY'd pretty uh, easily if you are, which I'm not, uh, a little bit handy. Um, but there are some very, very inexpensive alternatives to this um, when you're starting out. Okay. This is, um, this is it's the biggest, like, embarrassing mess. Um, but uh, this is where I put, um, uh, what's called, um, emulsion on my screens. Uh, which I'll go over, but essentially the uh, what I'm showing you is the um, uh, the technique for screen printing I use is a photo uh, technique. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, photography, basically what it is is I take a drawing, and again I'll show you all this, and um, I scan it in, I print it out on a semi-clear piece of paper called mylar, and then um, set that aside, and I put this photosensitive material on a screen, um, here's one of my screens. Here's actually the uh, Winnie the Pooh screen. I put this green stuff, this is photo emulsion, and I coat the screen with it. Now that stuff will um, stay soft, it'll harden, but if I hit it with a hose, it'll just blow away as long as it stays in the dark, okay? And uh, if I hit it with light, it hardens like plastic. And so what I do is I take that Mylar with the print, and I lay it down and I hold it flat with like a piece of glass and put a lot of weight on it. And then on the back side, on this side is against the light. And or when, I'm sorry, the, 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 the mylar would go uh, against this. So when the light hits this, it's gonna harden everything except for what's blocked by that uh, drawing. And so when I turn off that light, you've got some of this, the image that's still soft and I can blow out with a hose leaving the holes there where the ink goes through. And then I just push it through, push the ink through with a squeegee. And I will demonstrate that. All right, um, let's see. The other part of this is my, um, my press. Okay? So the press, I move things around. I, I like to call these things octopus presses. Um, but you can see up here, I have these different arms and they can grip screens. Um, and then right here, I have these kind of tabletops on a swivel that I can swing around. I forgot that I had the heater on. That's very hot. Okay. And I, I, um, I do something, I, I still print like I print on paper. So I have a piece of clear acetate that I print on so I can line up all my drawings. The screen itself, like I said, kind of hooks into these octopus arms up here. And I'm going to attach this in. And my thing is super old. I actually have a, a little 
bungee cord attached to the ceiling. And I, I have a little hook that I attach or, or a little clamp that I put onto my screens. Um, I, I, I have an emotional attachment to this, this, this press. I acquired it from a screen printer that I admire, um, uh, Rachel Bone, who is uh, used to do uh, Red Prairie Press, just a, a brilliant artist and printer. And uh, it's it, this has kind of been uh, because of that kind of passed around Baltimore. But it's kind of old and fading, but it still works really well for me, even though I had to do a bunch of things. So essentially, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do some printing. But before I do, I also wanted to show you a couple other elements. If I tilt this over here. You can see right here, which I'm trying not to touch too much because it's red hot, it's pushing heat down um, so that I can um, uh, heat set this. Um, but it is, you can see like the cross pattern, uh, it's on wheels on the ground with a big pole and it kind of hangs over so that I can get the shirt under it really quickly. And then finally, which this, this is a disaster, get ready for it because it's shared by my wife and I, uh, she has, a ceramic studio. Although my my studio looks like a dungeon. Check this out. Hers is like all bright and beautiful and and awesome, uh, and it, it, inviting and awesome. So here is our crazy like just covered in ink and clay um, washout station. And um, all I do is I hook up. I don't know if you can see it, but it's just a garden hose, so that I can like you have some some good pressure while I'm while I'm printing. All right, so let's do the demo. Okay. So let me make sure I have this set up so we can see everything. All right. Oh. Where am I? There we go. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right. So I'm going to get a t shirt. I used to, I like uh, uh, foam core, uh, which is relatively inexpensive for how long you use it for. Um, I actually have measurements in, in the uh, power in the uh, Google slide presentation. I'm going to slip this into a t-shirt. Uh, I have links to good places that you can purchase bulk t-shirts. I've already printed, as I showed you before, my um, Spaghetti Kiss logo. And I'm going to put this down and I'm going to toss my... Uh, acetate down across it, make sure it's nice and flat against it. I'm going to bring this down on top. All right. Now I've already mixed my ink and it's a very kind of creamy orange uh, because I'm going to be printing Winnie the Pooh. So uh, it's all nice and mixed. It's kind of goopy the way sc uh, screen printing ink uh, is. It's kind of like... Um, Oh, it looks like if you're making meringues, you know, it's, it's goopy and yeah, or icing or something. Right. So I'm going to put a bead down. Hopefully you can see that. And I'm going to leave this somewhat close. I usually have things a little bit more cluttered so I can get to things quickly. Now I have my squeegee. All right. Um, these things get dirty quick, even if you're hosing them off every single time, but you can see it's got this like kind of, rubbery like like dense rubber uh blade they call it uh and then a wooden handle that's contoured so you can get a good grip but it's still hugging this really tight so i use water-based inks which means that they can dry out in the screen most screen printers uh use uh what's called plastisol uh plastisol is uh is it's it's when you get that like thick film like plasticky film on a t-shirt uh it's very it's great for solid colors um, it also never dries until you put it through the heat. I'm just going to get that out of the heat for a second. Um, whereas water-based uh, inks, it's water. So once the water leaves it, it's dry. So if you heat set it while it's still wet, it makes it permanent. The nice thing is with water-based inks, once you print it, uh, it'll have a little bit of like a film or crust to it. But once it goes through the wash once, it almost feels like there's nothing on the garment, which is fantastic. But you have to be better about cleaning things up. All right, uh, I also have to make sure that it doesn't like dry out in my screen as I go. So I'm gonna do my first pull. It's just to put the image on that plastic. So I'm gonna take this, do one pull, and then I'm gonna lift it up and I'm gonna very gently push 
my ink all the way across in order to make sure that there's ink in everything so it stays wet. Okay. Now, if I hold this up like this, you can see that Winnie the Pooh is on the plastic sheet. And now I just line up what's underneath to the plastic sheet. Which I usually have like, like I said, a lot of like offensive light this way, but I couldn't see anything uh, on the, uh, it made the, the image for this really bad. So I'm going to, I'm going to line it up. The, the trick is you want to be able to easily fit three fingers between the, um, not, not on this one, this one prints off the neck, which is a pain, but you want to easily fit three fingers between where the bottom of the collar is and the top of your design. There's many reasons why you might break that rule, but if you're doing a dead center design like this, that's kind of the rule of thumb. So I have it lined up, pull this away, and I drop this down, okay? I'm actually gonna add a little bit more ink. I don't know if I put enough down. Just to make sure, never wanna over ink because then it gets all gloopy and all over the place and it can over flood things. And then I'm gonna uh, do another pull. And I wanna keep my blade at a 45 degree angle, pull. And I'm gonna tell you this, whenever I demo this, I always screw up prints the first time I demo. I could do 400 prints in a row, not mess up a single shirt, but as soon as it's in front of people, I screw it all up. So let's see how I did. If I didn't screw it up, this will be like an absolute first of me doing it in front of people. If I flood my screen, I bring it up and, oh yeah, that's all, okay. And here we go. There it is. So, all right. Next, I'm actually, uh, normally I could have uh, this print on both ends and just swing this around, print on the next plastic piece. But because I don't want to waste too much ink with this and I'm only doing a few, I'm going to bring over the other one, which I didn't print on. Plus, this is, is hot. Like, I can feel the heat right off of this. So I can take this, and I can lay it down nice and flat. And I'm going to spin it around. And it's under the heat over there right now, just waiting for me. So I'm going to grab another shirt and throw it on here. I feel bad. I feel like I'm, like, getting worked on while I'm doing this. <laughs> And I line this one up, same deal, thinking about the center of the shirt, thinking about that three finger rule. I go a little bit above this because I want his sword, his little sword to kind of get up closer to the neck. And then I pull another one. Boom. I'm gonna take this and put it over here because I'm not doing it on both sides. Bring this over. This is now dry. Okay. And this is like ready to go. So it's easy for me now to just fold. You get really good at folding t-shirts when you do them a hundred at a time and go around. And so I want to clean out my screen, but because I have it flooded, that means there's enough in this already to just print the next one. So I'm going to do one more. And then I'm going to clean the screen. Now, when I clean my screen, um, I don't want to bring my laptop over because I don't want to get any backsplash on. Uh, this is my wife's brand new laptop. It's super fast and awesome. So I don't want to sit that next to a garden hose. Um, so I'm actually going to um, uh, put the bring back my slideshow as soon as I finish printing this. And I'm going to uh, take like two or three minutes to do that. And I think that it's a really good time if you haven't yet to just maybe do some minor sketching um, and working on combining things in, an, in a fun and interesting way. So I got that lined up, I think. All right, so here I am, I'm gonna clean this up. So I do the print, but now instead of me flooding the screen, I'm actually gonna to try to conserve as much ink as I can. Kind of look at two places at once. Go. And I have a 
spatula in here that I have a bunch of uh, these spatulas. I always find stuff like that at TJ Maxx. That I don't know how good they'd actually be for cooking, but TJ Maxx and Marshalls are like the best places to find tools for printmaking. Um, oh, and ugly Christmas sweaters, which I'm obsessed with. My favorite is a Santar. It's a Santa Claus Santar. It's awesome. Yeah, and that's. I don't know why I brought that up. I just got really excited about TJ Maxx, and that came up. All right. So what I'm going to do is I should probably put this over in the heat setter so I don't light the basement on fire. Fold that later. Put this one on. And while I give you all a little bit of instruction for while I'm gone, this can be heat setting. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again. So teaching for as long as I did digitally, I got used to talking while I do things. Um, and I like I feel like I'm my own narrator at this point, which I'm sorry if that's super annoying. Okay. Here we go. So I'm going to leave it on this slide. Am I still pinned? I just realized I might be. You no, I'm not. Okay, so the correct screen is up there. My uh... Thanks. Uh, well, drawing prompt. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. So yeah, if you haven't yet, just, again, just these don't have to be beautiful, refined sketches, but just really think about an interesting and fun way to combine things. Um, and actually, I am going to change the screen I'm sharing for a moment. Let's see. How do I, how can I move this? Aha. Okay. So if I go over here in that Padlet, you can see that I have over here um, a place for you to post your t-shirt design sketches. Um, and actually if, um, Renee or China, if if or, or Saz, if you have access to the Padlet, Saz's Padlet, um, if you could take the link for this and put it in the chat, so it's really. It's I did it already. Oh, you're yeah. the best. Thank you. So um, I I did I, I put two. One is like the 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 Santa Claus one is what I was thinking about doing for a uh, uh, like a holiday themed T-shirt this year, and uh, I'm just gonna turn off my heat setter, and that's good. Um, and the other one was a design I did last year for, for Valentine's Day. And they're both kind of creepy, but in very different ways. But they're both like, you know, it's me trying to think of, you know, the silhouette, but it doesn't have to be something that's clever. It can just be thinking about this balance of things sticking out and not just a box. Um, so, yeah, feel free to post stuff here. Uh, they, they don't have to be like quality drawings. This is way more about the idea. Um, but I will leave it on this screen and I will be back in three or four minutes. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to turn on some music. In the meantime, everybody take some time to get your drawings together. We want to see these amazing ideas. I'm really excited.
my god that's so cool <laughs> oh my god i'm already seeing something in there and it makes me so happy um oh man uh, that's great that's awesome i already like as far as uh, I, I um if anybody's popped over to the padlet there's already design over there uh if you if the person who posted it wants to claim it uh you should be uh very proud um it is uh especially for such a like a a quick like off the cuff drawing it is an owl cone and it's crying my favorite aspect is it's that very like um uh, iconic like cone form it's it's not too sharp it's rounded at the bottom it's got beautiful texture but the silhouette from the feathers coming off um is such a good idea i think it could be pushed more with like more feathers coming out but there is like the idea of its nest or its feathers coming out uh, as like the edges of the ice cream it's just really fun yeah wait does that mean there's more <gasps> oh 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 god oh my god is that a sewing machine and a person just like sewing them back together that's great um yeah um i, I will say that t-shirts tend to be vertical so taking something like this and just having fun with that vertical space could be awesome because i think that like this wobbliness is really fun um and and yeah uh again like those textures on um the body uh are, are just like give it like a gray space that's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> is that a wolf and pizza? <laughs> uh, that's pizza. I'm I'm not getting back, um, which is very sad. I I love pizza. That's what I had for dinner tonight. Um, that's a beautiful drawing. And uh, for somebody to be thinking this much about line weight already, we have. Uh, if you if you're um, across the street, you can see a design like this, and you're like, oh, it's wolf and pizza. Uh, to push it even farther, I would say, um, first of all, again, the beautiful thicker line around the edge really highlights the texture of the fur. The eyes and the nose just snap and just immediately uh, come together. Um, adding more lines in the sauce of the pizza or making the sauce have more like black space is going to separate it out so we can see just as much of the silhouette of that top and bottom jaw or even just a thicker line around there is going to push that a long way. Now that very easily could just be a, Oh, I got this much done and let me post it. Um, but th this is, this is the beginnings of like a really great drawing and it's, it's a very cute. Um, uh, it's, it's like adorable and realistic at the same time. I really like it. The droop of the pizza is also really nice. <laughs> oh, that's, that's so much fun. I love that. Um, yeah, octopus and ice cream cone. Oh man, you all just totally gra like grabbed onto this in a great way. That's that's so fun. <laughs> I really like the two little knobbly arms. <laughs> They're so cute. Um, yeah, I like anything that that's dripping, and uh, because I feel like it just gives like movement. So as soon as you have any dripping, we're imagining it coming down further. And actually having something that uh, if if you take one drip and have it start to interrupt into another space, like have it start to go over an eye. And then we start to, uh, in that case, what we would do is we relate to it and we start thinking about, oh my God, I can picture something coming in front of my eye. Uh, so just thinking about pushing drips like that even further. But this is this is super fun. It's got beautiful line quality, uh, especially for such like a quick like concept sketch. The, Y'all, these are great. Um, I really appreciate you y'all uh, just jumping in and and doing some drawings and being open to share them. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, oh man, this padlet like zooming back out. It's just so great. I love it so much. Um, all right, so uh, keep drawing, keep posting things. Um, and uh, oh, Saz, that was yours. That I should have known. I I should I know your your drawing style so well um that's great um so keep pl plopping things in here feel free to uh give words of encouragement to each other in in comments i have this open so you could put in comments um I i'm just gonna go through I, I like all these i'm gonna just go through and heart the hell out of them they're wonderful um but the next thing that i wanted to do is uh and i'll come back to this uh towards the end but i really wanted to 
Okay, so we just did a studio tour and the screen printing demo. Um, if you've never screen printed before, hopefully watching me do it is like, oh, that's how it's done. That is how it's done when it comes to one color prints. Um, I actually, my way to do it is a little convoluted. It's it's a little bit more like printing on paper. Um, and uh, I never really learned how to do uh, that. You know, usually you just put the, the t-shirt right on uh, the, the, the tabletop thing that I have here, which is normally called a platen. They're smaller and they have little neck shapes. And then you just put it on print, put it on and print. It's a much faster process than what I do. Um, um, but hopefully just seeing me do it gives you an idea. So let's go back and uh, talk about, if I back up, we talked about the three major components of a studio. And um, the first one is the exposure station, which has two parts. It has where you're prepping your screen and getting it ready. And then the other part is where you're actually putting it together and um, uh, exposing the unit. Um, uh, you do have to, once you make use of your washout statement uh, station during that process. Um, but again, all that is, is a uh, utility sink and uh, a garden hose. Uh, and I can talk about some, if you're living in a, an apartment, I can even talk to you about some different ways to, to do that. Um, so your emulsion and prepping for a screen. Uh, when you mix your emulsion down here in the bottom left, you're going to see the emulsion and uh, you can actually buy these little Diazo sets. Uh, they work great. Um, and uh, I think they're like, it's like 35 bucks, but you could probably make 10 to 15 screens um, depending on the size of your screens uh, with them. Um, on the right, you'll see a, a, a smaller and a larger bottle. The larger bottle is just the liquid base of it. The smaller bottle is filled with a powder, I think, that is um, very photosensitive. And you actually have to mix a little bit of water into that and stir it up in the dark. Um, however, uh, I have, uh, let's see, I don't know if you can see it back here, but I have a little, red light that just turned on. So I turn off all the lights and I have a red light. And so you're doing everything kind of like by photo light. Um, it's not as sensitive as actual photography equipment. So you can also stream Christmas lights or have indirect light from like, uh, like sometimes my wife's studio lights are all on and it's still fine. Um, so basically once you mix that, you uh, take something kind of like a squeegee uh, over here in the, the bottom right. Uh, with the green ends is kind of this like it's called a scoop tray. Uh, it 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 has like a really sharp, well not sharp, but really fine edge on it. And so uh, I forgot I have one, so I can just grab it and show you. Um, they only look like that picture once and then never again because screen printing stuff gets horribly nasty uh, with all of the like dried ink. And here's like an old nasty. Uh, uh, print. So you can see in this tray, you would pour in the dark the emulsion in here. And then you'd lean it against this and wipe it up there. And it would coat it really well. You can use little, um, well, like little like, uh, like paint scrapers to like kind of spread it and get it out to the edge. And then uh, mine all, I, I use duct tape on both sides to, to make it like watertight around the wood so it doesn't warp or start to come apart. Which depending on how much you print, they do come apart eventually uh, a lot. Um, going back to the image on the bottom left, uh, there's a third bottle, that's the remover. Um, that stuff, uh, I, I suggest wearing uh, gloves when you use it and just having like a little um, like dishwashing or like a brush, like a dish brush. Um, you pour that on the emulsion once it's dried out in your screen and it breaks it down. It's real potent stuff. Uh, I had an allergic reaction to it once in high school and it was no fun. Um, and then you use like a nylon brush and you, you you scrub it and then you let it sit for 15 minutes and then you hit it with the hose and it should clean out. Um, and then of course up top is the screens. Now, if you look at the description here, um, uh, these links should take you to places where you can actually buy this equipment um, if you're comfortable with the, the photo stuff. Um, and um, it, it's not, I wouldn't say it's all inexpensive, it adds up, but once you get like a, a baseline of stuff, um, it's not too hard to do. Um, <clears throat> but again, I, I'm gonna show you lots of different ways to do this. So, but if you're going the photo route, 
uh, this is the way to do it. Uh, as for an exposure station, the thing I showed you is probably uh, like that, that big light table. Don't worry about that. I actually, for years, uh, used just a, a photo light, like a, a 250 watt daylight bulb. Um, and um, I, a, uh, you know, the, the, those silver clamp lights you get at Home Depot, um, they're actually up all over my studio. But you can get, for not much more money, ones that are rated up to 300 watts. And, and it does a good job of like creating a dome of light. And then, um, so down at the bottom here, I have my screen with the well side up and I have my emulsion. You can see my gloopiness in there, that the little drawing of the gloop. And then I have my clear paper with my skull octopus that I'm gonna put down on top of that. And then a piece of glass, that's just to hold it nice and steady on there, okay? And then um, you turn on the light above it and the light hardens everything that's not covered by the drawing. Uh, times, as it says down here, times and distance can vary based on many factors. Some of those factors you would never believe. Some of them are like the temperature. Some of them are like the elevation or the humidity level in your house um, can change how long it takes. So I always like to do the rule of 22, um, 22 inches between the bulb and the screen for 22 minutes and, and then take it out and go and uh, try to wash out the screen. And if it doesn't wash out, well, you cooked it for too long. Um, if it washes and goes through, you need to cook it for longer. Um, cook is a funny word because it's just light. Okay, so here is a video um, gonna show you that is from front to back, me making a screen. Um, it was one I did for a reel for Instagram, so I apologize that it's a little promo-y. Um, but it's it's only a 40 second video, kind of like snaps through everything. Uh, but it's it works. And if I need to, uh, I might run it a, a second time just so you know what's coming, because it kind of goes by kind of quickly. All right. It's Sunday morning in the Spaghetti Kids dungeon, and it's time to make a new screen for the holiday season. <laughs> That's the screen. Then I hit it with this stuff to make it darker and more opaque. Then I tape it together to line it up, which is a pain. This is me putting water into the thing and, and shaking it up, the, the uh, photo sensitive stuff. This is me putting it into the other uh, liquid, mixing it up, putting it in there, scraping it up, cleaning that off, burning the screen, washing it out. And then this is just me. I haven't taped it yet, but this is me holding up to the light. It's a Christmas tree coming out of a box, but the Christmas tree is made of tentacles. That was my holiday tea last year. So I'm going to play that again, and I'm going to shut the heck up so that you can just kind of take it in. It's Sunday morning in the Spaghetti Kiss Dungeon, and it's time to make a new screen for the holiday season. <laughs> It's Sunday. Come on. There we go. Okay. And just because I realized right now that it was right next to me, here's that t-shirt. Yeah. All right. Uh, Renee, uh, I appreciate you so much, by the way. You are like letting me know when things are readable, but with your head nods. And I mean this sincerely. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So, so printing. Um, these giant things that I have, the octopus press, uh, can be, um, it adds up. Like you can get them pretty affordably, but it all depends. If this is something that you like, hey, I want to spend a few weekends and figure out if I can do this and I don't want to spend thousands of dollars. You don't have to. Um, um, there are, I don't, I don't know. I should have had a photo of it, but that's okay. I can link over. So if you have an old table, or an old draw, like a drawing table or some sort of kind of sturdy table. 
um, or even something that you get from like Ikea and you don't mind drilling some holes into it, you can have a printing table. And when you print on paper, you print on a tabletop, but instead of having this big octopus arm thing, I don't know if you can see over on the left where I have down at the bottom is the, um, the clear uh, acetate with a print on it and a little string of tape over on the left to give it a hinge. But the screen above it, if you look back down at the bot base of it, there are these things called hinge clamps that you can buy. Um, I'm going to try to click over so I can show you a photo of them, see if that works. Yeah. So they look like this, and you actually drill them right into your tabletop. And, and then they like hug onto your screen and then go up and down and up and down. So it's always coming back to the exact same place. And you can get a set for how much do they have them in here? They're usually like 25 bucks. Yeah, 27 bucks. Um, and they're great. And, and then like the acetate you can get at like an art store or even Michael's for like five bucks. And, and, and just with an old tabletop, you can have something that you're like, you know, a, able to have a, a complete thing. Now you're not going to have the swing arm. Um, so, um, you'd have to, you'd have to actually take it over to a heat setter and place it underneath it. Or, um, uh, you can also like use a heat gun, but, um, you know, it, it works just as well. Let me see if I can get back to it. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, we've got the ink, the squeegee, the foam board. Um, and I, like I said, I have stuff everywhere. Um, T-shirts. When I started, I would wait for them to go on sale at Michael's. Uh, and uh, which is still not a bad option if you're just like hobbying out. When they go on sale at Michael's, they're the same price that you get when you buy them in like huge bulk uh, places. They are literally trying to offload them. I, I don't know how they, they probably get a better deal than, than I can. Um, but after years, you know, you, you build, you, you actually like can get accounts with, with different, um, suppliers. Um, but before I, I had like a deal with a supplier, I actually really loved this site called Jiffy shirts and Jiffy shirts is great. Um, I think that they uh, are an overstock place. Uh, I really don't know, but they're, they're only like, a couple percentage points above what you get um, when you're going through an actual supplier. Um, I uh, I should have put this in here, um, uh, but my favorite my favorite T-shirts to print on um, are the Gildans G I L D A N, um, the Soft Style S O F T S T Y L E one word. Um, the code for them is G six four zero. Um, just so you know, you have the right ones. They have the structure of that like classic unisex T, but they're super soft. So, and so they're like a large is actually a large, a medium is actually a medium. Um, and then when you're going into more, um, um, I guess tailored and, uh, especially when you get into like more feminine cuts, um, um, I suggest using next level apparel. It's more expensive for sure, but their stuff is beautiful. It's the best. Um, okay. So that's, that's for printing and this kind of, hopefully this makes sense. Um, let's see. Ah, washout station. I don't really have any links here because everything you, you, you can get at like a Home Depot, but I literally, my washout station is a garden hose. Um, the nozzle um, I have a, a two-sided washout sink, uh, mostly because our washing machine uh, dumps its water instead of like into it. So we have one side that's for art and one side that's for laundry. Um, and uh, just like a, as big as you can find it, but actually like a dish rack is really helpful for storing your squeegees. Um, you usually want to have multiple squeegees um, because if, if you actually get to the point where you're creating a production line, uh, if you need to change ink colors, you can't like use an already wet squeegee. You need to be able to let it dry. So having another one on deck is really important. Although as a hobbyist, having one or two is fine. Okay, so that's a whole lot. When you're dealing with um, all the photo emulsion stuff, if you're sitting here like, this is great, I wish you could do it, but holy hell, there's no way. Um, there's a lot of different alternatives. My favorite alternative 
my absolute favorite alternative is this right here. Okay. Now you'd still need to, um, I still suggest uh, doing the whole printing station on a tabletop um, just to be able to like pull something down and hold it and, and print it. Um, because if you actually have to hold something down, you might need a second pair of hands. Um, but if you have a printing station uh, and if uh, you, you have a washout station, and I should have talked about this, a backup. Oh, I have it in here. Snake your garden hose from outside into your bathtub. Um, water, water-based inks are safe to go down the drain. Um, and they, they really don't stain. I've, I will say this. If you have porcelain, I know for a fact it doesn't stain at all, obviously, but I'm pretty sure even with like the acrylic tubs, it's not going to stain as long as you're spraying it and making sure it goes down. Um, um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So this alternative is my favorite. So you have things called screen filler and drawing fluid. Screen filler is basically something you put on a screen that is permanent or at least semi-permanent. You, you can get it out, but it's like, until you put a chemical on it, it ain't going anywhere. And the drawing fluid is something that you can paint it on. It'll dry, but it'll stay soft enough that you can spray it out with a garden hose. So what you can do is take your drawing, let me grab one. Oh, here. I just did, oh, my cat came down to say hello. This is, this is Wish. Kind of funny. Hi. Ah. All right. So I just, just did, uh, this is my positive. You know, it's on the clear paper. I just did a creature from the Black Lagoon design, Black Lagoon design for uh, Halloween. And um, so basically I would do a drawing and I wouldn't have to do it on this paper. I just grabbed the nearest image I had. And I would lay this down. And then I would take my screen and I would put the screen over it. You could see through the screen because it's just like a mesh. You know, you can, I don't know if you can see me actually. Yeah, yeah, you can see through it, right? Yeah. Um, and that's an old, real dirty one. Um, and you basically trace the drawing with a brush and this drawing fluid, right? And then um, you let it dry. And then using the tray, and this it takes a little practice to get it right. So do a couple of real dummy designs just to make sure it works. You just fill the screen with the screen filler. Let that dry and then go spray it with the hose and all the screen drawing fluid just blows out. And so you have that same kind of stencil. I This is how I do it when I do it with my middle school students. And um, last year, um, I still don't know how. Uh, um, I, I uh, Anyway, last year, um, eight weeks before the end of school, I was fortunate enough to hold off on getting COVID until of uh, late May of 2022. And um, uh, I, I woke up on a Monday morning, uh, Monday morning, I, like with a sore throat, tested and was like, I got to stay home. And I had been promising my students all year that I was going to teach them how to do t-shirt design. And I had to do it remotely. And um, so I, I, I actually, I, the, the, the drawing prompt that I gave to you uh, was a thing that I did as a remote like module for my students. And it was students I'd worked with all year for uh, two years at this point. And so they really ran with it and they came up with some really great ideas um, and some really great drawings. And so I was out for two weeks. And when I finally came back in, it was like time to print. And I had to find the simplest friggin' way to make this work. And this is what we did. And it worked awesome. It worked. Um, everybody got one shot at it. Everybody got to try just once. And I had never done it this way before. Well, that's not true. I did it once 20 years ago in college. And so I've got all these kids who are awkward and don't know how to use this material. And a lot of times with, with printmaking, the mess up factor for students of, of that age is just high. And you have to be open to like, try again, but we didn't have time. It was like a week and a half till the end of school. And these kids are graduating eighth grade. And they're like, I put my heart and soul into this. And this was pretty, pretty good. It worked uh, pretty well. First try. I made one. I don't have it here, but I made one and I thought it worked great. You have to be comfortable drawing with a brush and ink um, and, and kind of celebrating the little mistakes that happen because of the materials. But if you're looking for, I don't want to spend money on like half of this stuff and deal with the headache of all the trial and error, this is the best way to do it. It's awesome. Um, 
and there's trial and error, but it's trial and error that is not as frustrating. You just, you know, you could just do a screen and draw like a bunch of like shapes and patterns and things like that and just blow through it and practice and see what happens. And then that's really going to help you figure out how it's going to work for you and your drawings. Okay. Other alternatives. Oh, oh, here's a picture of one of my students, one of my very favorite students last year. Um, I had kids sharing screens. On the left was a kid who's like, uh, penguins playing basketball. I don't know if you could see it. Her drawing was really great. It was an alien solving Rubik's cubes. And, but it's surrounded by like hundreds of Rubik's cubes. It's like building a house out of all the solved. It's like this very like, look at how superior I am. I've got all these Rubik's cubes and I'm using them as bricks for my home, puny earthlings. It's a great idea. And she's a great kid. Um, so yeah, it, it's this, this beautiful blue. And like I said, it dries, but it dries to this like almost like hardened gel. So it blows right through. All right. Digital alternatives. If you're like, no, I just want to do a good drawing, scan it in and have somebody else print it for me. I am willing to fork over a little bit of extra dough um, to have somebody print a stock of shirts for me so that I can turn around and sign up for conventions and things and just sell that. And I don't want to be making it. Well, great news. That's actually really accessible. And I only have two of them here, um, but these are two that I know have very low minimums, meaning that you'd have to pay setup fees, which depending, and you can have as, I think as few as like 25 shirts at a time. So you can have a budget of like two or $300 and um, print like 50 shirts or 25 to 50 shirts, you know, and, 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 and the more you do, the less per item it costs. Um, uh, black collar printing is somebody that I've personally worked with before. Uh, they're local to Baltimore. Uh, I live in Baltimore. I don't know how, I don't know where everybody is actually, uh, where you're located. I'm actually very curious. Um, actually, if you want to sound off in the chat, I'm curious how local everybody is. Um, just put your city or state. Um, but black collar printing, uh, is great to work with. I think that they do ship out also, but if you can find somebody in your area, you save a lot of money by just pick up. Um, and then Jack Prince is internationally known. Uh, I'd be, I, I'd be surprised if at least a couple of you had never, if there wasn't somebody here. So like, oh yeah, now I've never personally used Jack Prince just cause I print my own stuff. Um, however, uh, I've had plenty of friends that I've done shows with that would print through Jack Prince and they, they are very high quality and very reliable, um, and very affordable. You're looking at like not including the setup costs, which is like that one-time cost, to, like make the screens, but you know, for a single color print, maybe seven fifty or eight bucks a shirt to print a shirt that you can turn around and sell for twenty uh, to twenty five. Um, oh, uh, Renee, did we get any uh, uh, locations? I'm curious. Oh, we 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 did. We have. Uh, let me go up to the top. Actually, people are very engaging. We have Bowie, Maryland, Gaithersburg, another Maryland, Silver Spring, Hampton, with an exclamation mark. Hampton, Hampton! Baltimore. Uh, Oregon. Oregon. Nice. Oregon. Uh, Laurel. Uh, the Oregon is from Maryland, though. And that's that was the only, but that's, that's oh. a small group. That, oh, wow. Very local. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. So, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So if you are local uh, and you are looking for something like this, I would I would love to plug um, Black Collar Printing. They were they were fantastic. I really liked working with them. All right. Now, if you're like, okay, this is great. I really want to make t-shirts and I really want to start a business, but ew, people. I don't want to have to go and like do all these things and like buy a tablecloth and folding tables and a tent and all that stuff sounds icky. Um, that's a lot of people. Um, actually, um, uh, my my wife, uh, she enjoys doing shows, but she's a potter, uh, Pink Kiss Pottery. She actually screen prints on clay. We've collaborated a lot. Um she she only does like five shows a year and 99% of, of what she does, well, maybe like 85% of what she does is all sold online and uh, through her her um, her online store. And my stuff, yeah, I have an online store. Yeah, it's a part of my income, um, but it's never something that I've ever been able to like make that the, the driving force of what I do. It's always been like, this is a supplement to how I make my living. Uh, whereas I love being in person. I'm very much a people person. I love talking about the books I've written. Um, I love telling people like why I'm passionate about things. I love like 
seeing familiar faces and return customers and building those relationships. It's the best for me. And so I always want to do physical shows. Not everybody wants to do that. So um, <clears throat> I get, there's two options, uh, two types of options that you have. You have services like, uh, so print on demand is basically you just go to a site and you upload your designs and then people could just purchase from that site. Now there's two kinds of versions of that. Number one is Printful. I have a lot of experience with this. I told you before how I work with a super art fight. Um, I, I do a lot of the screen printing for that group, um, but not like sometimes when we would do, uh, I remember back in the early days of, of COVID, we uh, couldn't do live shows and we were doing, um, <clears throat> we were trying to, uh, we were doing these online shows, which was really fun, but you know, it wasn't the same. But what, our favorite venue and our home, uh, if you're familiar with the Auto Bar, it's a, it's a really well-known uh, Baltimore rock club. It's our home. It's where we play like a huge chunk of our shows. Um, I love that venue. And they had just changed ownership. The new owner is this fabulous person who has done wonderful things at that venue. And, you know, just like everybody else, they were in danger of closing. And, and we were like, oh, my God, we want to go and do something. And, and, you know, everybody was trying to raise little bits of money here and there for everybody. And, and we wanted to get in on that. And so we did a t-shirt design that we um, printed, but we, we wanted to do this multicolor design and I don't have the setup for it. And I was just trying to stay mentally healthy. And I was like, I don't know if I, I want to print like 400 t-shirts. So for that, we went through black collar printing, which is the experience I have with that. But the other thing we did is we wanted to support the artists. And so we had them all design character shirts and we sold them through Printful. Now Printful is great because you can basically take your designs and put them on a multitude of products. Uh, the best things, to, or not the best, but the, the most accessible things to do are t-shirts. Um, and then you can actually use it as an app into your own online store. So if you have an Etsy or a Shopify or something like that, it's actually your storefront. And yes, they take a cut, but basically you are advertising these things. You put it out there through your Instagram, through your mailing lists, and people buy it, and that company just makes it and ships it off. The other option, which isn't all that different, are things like Threadless and Redbubble, um, and um, maybe Custom Ink. I don't know if they, if they do the thing I'm about to say. But um, basically, with Redbubble, um, you create an account, and you just upload designs, and you have an account in Redbubble. So people go to Redbubble and just start searching. And if somebody's like, I love octopus and ice cream, and they stumble upon that beautiful design, um, they're they're going to buy it. And Redbubble is going to take like probably like 75% of the money because of what it takes to produce. And then they're cut. And then you just get to cut a check at the end of the uh, month. I know a lot of people who have Redbubble sites and it's a huge part of their living, especially with comic artists who um, are constantly updating. And every time they come up with a new design, they uh, they plop it on Instagram and everybody's like, ooh, that's awesome. And it's like, well, here's the link to the red bubble. All right. Now, that is a, effectively, and I, I think I, I'm like, I'm hitting the timing like right on the head. I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. That's effectively all the information I have, or at least that I've prepared. Um, and I wanted to be able to kind of leave this last chunk as, as kind of an, an open time. Um, if you wanted to sketch, if you wanted to design share, but really, if you want to ask me questions or or ask me to be more specific or to clarify, because I know I just rambled on for an hour and 35 minutes uh, and I might have skipped over something. So please feel free to put something in the chat or to um, uh, just unmute um, and or, or raise your hand so you can unmute and ask. Uh, for me, I am going to go on over and I want to see if there's any more t-shirt designs. Oh my God. There's so many more. That's so exciting. Oh man. Oh my God. Okay. That is absolutely a taco cat and it's making my day. Um, I love it. I love it so much. Oh, oh God. Look at that. All right. So, okay. So that is, hold on. Let me see if I can. That is an ice cream. Oh man, an ice cream dragon kitty. Um, I, I I think that the thing about this one that I love, uh, two things. Number one, the the texture on the belly, how that the the cone texture on the belly is just supple and beautiful. But the 
the actual um, silhouette of this is just, it's writhing and beautiful. And it sits on a shirt in a way that makes us think about movement. I love anything that makes you think movement. Um, this this kind of reminds me of, of like, you know, if you're a Harry Potter fan, uh, they have the dark mark tattoo. This is like the, the opposite of that. What's that? <laughs> I was like, it is so close to the dark mark, like with the shape of it, but it is like the polar opposite. Yeah. All the happiness. <laughs> I know. It's like, yay, let's come together for an ice cream party. <laughs> let's see. Oh, man. I really love the the use here of these stars, these like big poppy um, design elements with something that's very fuzzy. The ice cream. I love how many people want ice cream. Um, it is dessert time. Let's be real. That's that's awesome. Really good. Again, like <clears throat> we've got um, a very recognizable silhouette. Love the drips. Um, having drips coming at different levels can really help with the idea of the movement. Um, but also those are eyes you're going to see from across the street. So that's great. Oh, oh, this reminds me of, uh, is that, is that, it's like Mortal Kombat pizza. Um, which is essentially what Mortal Kombat is an excuse to do anyway, is sit around with your friends and eat pizza, uh, and play Mortal Kombat. Um, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Dragon pizza. I love it. Uh, I like that it's got this like kind of medallion esque feature, um, and um, this one, if you get the right color combination, like it's like yellow on like a dark orange t shirt, so it really has that pizza color. This is the kind of thing where, and if you weren't trying to do Mortal Kombat, please don't take that as an insult, because the fact that I immediately went boom, Mortal Kombat, and it's just a dragon made of pizza, that just means that oh man, I remember back in high school. Sorry. Or was that my echo? Hey, I have a question, actually. Yeah. Uh, I know that you referenced live events, and that is something I love to do as well. I I have a lot, I have this question that a lot of people have asked me, and that is, where do you find your events? And I know for the type of artist you are, and I think about myself, you know, there are certain events where my work is better suited for it. And I want to know where, if you're starting out and you're wondering, oh, how do I know this is a quality event or how do I find a good event? Where do you start? So that's a great question. And I, I don't think that there is like a singular answer to that, but there there's definitely guidance I can give on that. Um, I think number one, uh, the easiest, the easiest things to find are conventions. Um, because you could just, there's, I think there's like a convention finder website and you can go and find things that are like sci-fi conventions, um, gaming conventions, video game conventions, comic conventions, anime conventions. And if you're, and, and I do all of those, I've done gaming, music, horror, tattoo conventions, um, anime conventions, I've done tons of anime conventions. My work isn't anime at all, at all. Uh, tons of comic conventions. And and as much as I make comics, um, I, I'm very much in the independent realm of that. So it's not like I'm like drawing Superman. And, and I, I am. I'm in a room where most of the people want to find their favorite Spider-Man artist and don't give a crap about me. But I've found how to make my work stand out in those venues. And so uh, Google is is your best friend when it comes to conventions. Just Google like conventions in my areas and you'll find a bunch of sites that are just designed to help you find conventions. I'm pretty sure you could do the same thing with street festivals and indie craft fairs, but those are your buzzwords. Indie craft fairs, uh, uh, comic conventions and or just geek conventions and local street festivals. Once you find these things, go to them. Ask somebody like, I live in Maryland. I'd be like, oh, you want to do street festival? Arbutus has a great street festival. Um, yeah, you did that one, Saz. I saw you there. Um, uh, 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 Philly has one called the Kinetic Sculpture Derby the day before the Arbutus uh, Street Festival. That's fantastic. Um, Hunfest, Hamden Fest. So if you go to these and you show interest in it to somebody, um, one of my favorite things about these events is that it's a community and the vendors there a lot of times know each other and want to help people. Um, it's kind of rare that you have like me, I'm a t-shirt vendor. If I see somebody else with t-shirts, I'm like, all right, that means people are going to be coming here looking for t-shirts. I don't see it as competition, you know? Um, and so I always want new blood, new people coming in. And so going to these events and asking people for their recommendations is great. 
Um, but yeah, the, your, your three are indie craft fairs, street festivals, and conventions. I have a question. Yes. Do you start with pencil or do you start with pen like SAS does? Um, I start with pencil, but pencils for me, most of the time are working through gestures and silhouettes and ideas and not really about finding the details. They might find, be finding where the details go and organizing where things overlap. Um, but because my stuff is so much about the composition and I'm in a sketchbook thinking about how it's going to go on a t-shirt and uh, it, it's less like exploring a page and just seeing where things go, which is a very legitimate way to do make a piece of art. But when it comes to t-shirt design, I find that I, I very much like go in with a pencil, but my pencils are very rough. And then I use brush pens so I can get some really wild uh, line variation and things. If you look at that Santa Claus drawing I have, there's just tons of like big shaky lines and and, and inky bits, especially in the tentacles. Um, and I have one more question. Do you not recommend the flat press or like the iron-ons or stuff like that? Or um, No, I don't have anything against them at all. Um, I think that I, I just don't have a ton of experience with them. Um, I think that I'm always thinking about what's accessible for a person. Like for me, the reason I started doing t-shirts was because um, I didn't know what to do for groomsman party uh, uh, gifts for my, my groomsman for my wedding. And, but I was like the artist in the group of friends I had. So I designed them all t-shirts and they were all iron ons. And I was like, Oh my God, they like really liked these iron on t-shirts. And my wife made jewelry for, for everybody in, in the bridal party and everybody like freaked out about it. And so we opened up the bit, the business together. And, but you know, we were like first and third year teachers when we got married. So we had like no money and trying to figure out how to make things accessible and do things on like, absolutely like the lowest, like amount of money. And then as the business grew, I was able to like sprinkle in other things. So if you're going for the heat set thing, uh, the heat press, um, that is like to do that is a usually pretty big money investment for the stuff that's really going to be up to like mass production. Uh, Ijoma has their hand raised. Oh, please. Go ahead and answer your question, Ijoma. Yes, I was actually typing it, but um, my question is about. Well, um, you mentioned that you're a comic artist, so my question is about graphic novels, actually. Yeah. Um, I'm currently de developing my own, and I'm realizing I'm having a hard time keeping, like, the same style of how the characters and setting is drawn throughout the um, the book. It may maybe just be more of, like, a me thing, but, like, how do you, like, make sure your characters are drawn, like, the same way throughout the book, if that makes sense. No, like, that uh, absolutely makes sense. That's a great question too. Um, so there, there, on, on one level, like you don't want to go too hard on yourself. Sometimes things are like, aren't going to be completely consistent and you grow when you change as an artist through a book. Um, I, I just finished a series that I started working on uh, two months before my daughter was born. And I finished it two months before her uh, 10th birthday. And it was uh, 750 pages. It was three novels long. Um, it was it was my baby for literally a decade. And my drawing got a lot better in that decade. Um, that said, consistency, environmental and character consistency is very important. Um, when you are starting out a comic, sometimes you come up with an idea, you do a couple of character sketches, you jump right in and you're really excited. And I think you have to have a little bit of a uh, kill your darlings um, attitude early on. Um, and after you get those first like five or 10 pages out of the way and you're realizing, oh man, that didn't turn out exactly as I wanted to, but now you're comfortable in the world, you know what you want to do. So when it comes to characters, what I suggest is, um, and you can, uh, is trying to draw your character, like making character sheets where it's like front view, side view, three quarter view, looking down view and really trying to get some consistency there because once you get used to drawing it, you're building a reference that you can use throughout when it comes to environmental consistency. Um, if you're, if you're drawing in a room, make a blueprint of the room, uh, make like a top down 
like one point perspective blue, blueprint of the room. Design it. Consider yourself an interior designer. Um, if you're trying to do, uh, and this is one I don't do, and I'm going to from now on, a buddy of mine said this to me, and I wanted to punch my own face when I, I couldn't believe I never thought of it. Because the biggest pain in the to draw in comics are vehicles. They're the bane of everybody's existence. So build a collection of Hot Wheels. Hot Wheels are the greatest reference tools of all time. My One of my best friends like said that, and I just, I put my head in my hands because he's not a comic artist. And I have like 8,000 or 5,000 pages under my belt. And I just had this moment of like, God, how I feel like such an idiot trying to figure all this stuff. It would have saved me hours and hours. But giving yourself your own reference guides. Another tip with figures is if you're on Pinterest and you just look up like figure drawings, find your favorite poses and things like that. And then take your figure and actually superimpose it over these drawings. You know, you can like, uh, if you're working digitally, you can take some of these figure references and knock down the opacity so that they're light and just draw your figure on top of it. So if they're like sitting there like this or like this, you already have the guides to figure it out and you're trying to like make yours work with it. So really giving yourself that time for practice and figuring out the logistics of something is gonna go a long way in the long run. That was a great answer, a great question and a great answer. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? We're almost done. Well, if just in case, I, I, I wanted to just say, I've been looking at this um, this sketch this whole time and I'm, I've, I'm more and more in love with it the more I look at it. It is so cute. And I love uh, the um, how still the character is but how flowy that scarf is. It's just gorgeous. I just wanted to point that out and not skip over it. We have one more question and then two more people uploaded to the Padlet as well. Oh, yeah, they did. Um, Great. Uh, my did you uh, actually, yeah, I was just going to, because I'm I'm not super techno savvy, I wanted to uh, get your opinion on this. So I did, I really, really enjoyed this uh, um drawing exercise Thank you. and it really helped me like uh, um uh you know i haven't drawn anything for a very long time but i really enjoyed what came out because i ended up picking three things from the list oh, that's awesome. was, uh, guitar mermaid octopus oh is that what this one is that's awesome and i wanted to see whether you think that that's whether it's better like this upside oh, oh. where where she's right side up or whether it's more interesting this way i kind of oh no it. okay the first way you showed it to me the idea of, of this underwater this creature descending into the depths with her tentacles like flowing up as she's just jamming out has such a, an uh, idea of movement yeah no i think and, i think and it's actually a she's clinging to the bottom of a boat it's not easy you know it, it's not super easy to see but she's actually sitting on that bottom part of a boat so what i would say to that are two things having something like clinging to something larger that you only see part of is a tricky thing to design when it comes to t-shirts. Not impossible. It's a great idea, but it has to be absolutely clear. So including things like rudders or an anchor hanging down can be really important. But then if you do that, having the the entire thing just upside down so that like, I don't, if you can see on my design, it's, um, it's a partially completed robot that is hanging down from the neck. And we don't know what's up here, but everything's really clear. And this is very different from the design you're doing. But I had to think about how it connects up here. So thinking about how you're going to frame the neck with the, the bottom of a boat and then have this character hanging off of it, playing a lute. It's all about getting that clarity. And sometimes it's also about, like I said, killing your darlings and getting rid of the boat and just thinking of the silhouette and the movement of that character. Um, both ways are, are very legitimate ideas uh, and ways to design a shirt. It just really comes down to like what's going to work. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Oh my God. Is that a robot? Like, that's awesome. That this is a fun one to explore. You can really see what it is from a distance. You're like, there's a cat and there's something wrong with it. And I want to get closer and look at it. And again, like, that's what you want. You want to have something that looks like something intriguing from a distance 
It makes you want to get closer and explore it. The the segmented ankle and tail, the robotic arm with like like the big like punching glove, the exposed like metallic skull with the yeah, it's great. This is awesome. We do have one last question in the chat. It says, uh, what software do you use to draw your comics? And do you use text within the software or use another one? And then oh. after that, we're going to wrap it up. Okay, so I want to answer that, but I need a visual aid. So if you can wait for 30 seconds, I will answer that very quickly. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that, everybody. So, what program do I use to make my comics? Um, by and large, this. I do my comics uh, analog. When it's the comics that, um, let me see if I can find a good, interesting page, because I feel like these are all, well, whatever. When I'm doing my comics, everything is ink, and all the lettering is done by hand. Uh, I work on a comic called The Monuments. And with that one, just trying to find a, a fun. What do I got? What do I got? Well, I like the opening pages. I don't do the lettering, but I basically scan this in and pass it off to somebody else who does all the digital colors. Now, I do in my own book, in The Creators, um, uh, I do a book called The Creators. That's the 10-year project I was talking about. It's about um, young people who can bring their imaginations to life through their artwork and the catastrophic kind of social um, uh, ramifications of that power. And um, with that, I do all, everything in, in, in sketchbook. I scan it in and I do use Photoshop to add very minimal color and just to make sure everything is like lined up uh, and, and ready for press but most of it's by hand. All righty. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Um, did you have any last words before we close it out? I, I really don't. I'm, I'm just really, uh, I just want to very sincerely say thank you to everybody for like, man, having great questions and, and doing these awesome drawings. There's so many great ideas. I mean, we've just got like this jam full padlet of great ideas and um, you guys made, you all made this really fun for me. Uh, by engaging as much as you did. So thank you very much. Yay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Michael Rocco. And thank you, everybody who joined us this evening for From Process to Product, a guide to manufacturing your art. And be sure to join us for uh, the rest of the events we have going on this weekend. If you have the, if you have the opportunity, we have Sell, Speak, Stand Out, The Art of Public Speaking. We have uh, Dave Four, Makai Smith, and Unique Robinson, Collaboration and Community, People Make the World Go Round. And then on Friday, we have Jess Langley, Build Your Brand, Colorful Cohesion. So um, if you have the time, if you're available, please be sure to come out and join us for the rest of this week's Cultivating Creatives. And have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you can you. RSVP you so on operationarts.eventbrite.com. All right. I that. Everyone, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bracco. Thank you. <laughs>